I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations in the name of our Lord. Welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. My name is Page. I am your caffeine-imbued host. And today's portion of the Bible we're looking at, Exodus chapter 17. They're beginning their journey into the wilderness, and a couple of events take place that uh, bear looking at. One is the Israelites are complaining Shock of shocks, horror of horrors. Gosh, I'm so not surprised. Yeah, but their complaining takes on a very serious edge to it. Um, they're upping their game a little bit, these complainers. And then we're also going to see fallout from a centuries-old uh, conflict between the de descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. So let's get started. Exodus chapter 17. Oh, by the way, before I continue, um, I'm pre-recording this. So that means that I'm available to respond to you, any comments you might have in the uh, comment section below. And uh, feel free, please, to add your comments, uh, to call me out. If you disagree with me on something, I'm all up for it. So let's get started. Exodus chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. All right, let's take a look at a map here real quick. Desert of sin is all this area that I, you see uh, posted here. And Rephidim is this bottommost arrow, blue arrow marker thingy. Uh, so they're... They cross over the Red Sea, they're traveling around the desert. Now, these, these places, nobody's really sure where they're at. This is just one person's uh, idea of where Rephidim was. I have an issue with that. If they crossed over the Red Sea, where that other archaeologist and other commentaries said they did, and the right-hand arm there, then why would they be back here? Don't know. So a lot of this is up in the air, but we do know the desert of Sin is in the center area, and we're going to find that the Amalekites come from the north. So let's just take all that with a grain of salt. They're somewhere here in the middle of the map. That's as much as I can tell. They quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Now, when it says they quarreled with him, from the reading I did, this has, the wording used denotes some kind of, almost like a legal proceeding, like they're accusing Moses. And Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Moses is telling him, look, you got to be careful. I'm not the one you're fighting with. I'm not the one you're accusing here. You're accusing the Lord. He's the one you have an issue with. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. Now, there's, there's a sense of urgency here. Stoning is a judicial punishment that is enacted after sentence has been passed, a guilty sentence. So it's almost like they're accusing Moses in, uh, they're accusing Moses in a court of law. I mean, that's 
strictly not what happened, but that's the sense of it, right? So the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Curious choice of words here. God's talking to Moses, says, um, I will go, uh, see, da, 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 take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go, verse six, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. I will stand there before you. This is, if you're gonna accept a courtroom type setting here, a legal setting, God is usually the judge and we stand before him. You stand before a judge. And it says here, God says, I'm going to stand before you. We're going to stand in front of Israel, the people, the elders, and I'm going to stand before you as if I were the one accused, which Moses has been telling Israel, you're accusing the Lord. I'm not, your, I'm not the one you have a problem with. And so God stands in the place as the accused. Now, that's amazing to me. But isn't that what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross? He took our place. He became the accused and suffered the penalty of death. Well, this is a picture of that. And I, I, it's lost on me why God would use these words and what effect this would have in Israel but perhaps it was a matter of he wants them to see that they are accusing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not accusing Moses. So he is taking Moses' place as the accused. He is standing before Moses as if Moses were the judge. If that's what he wanted to do here, then I, I'm going to submit that it was lost on Israel because we're going to see that they just never quit complaining. Anyway, that was an interesting thought there. Uh, strike the rock, water will come out of it for the people to drink. And Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Imagine that. After the plagues, after the destruction of Pharaoh, the parting of the Red Sea, they can still say this. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow, I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Now, Amalekites, they were descended from Esau. And of course, Israel is descended from Jacob. And they would always be enemies to the descendants of Jacob. So though it appeared there was a reconciliation toward the end of Genesis, between Jacob and Esau when Jacob returned from his time with his uncle. Ultimately, the rift between them and the descendants obviously became too big to overcome. The descendants of these two brothers would always be at enmity with each other. Now, you know, I always used to wonder about that. Jacob's gone for 14, 15 years, all right? Uh, and I'm wondering if Esau thought, well, if Jacob's dead, then maybe the inheritance would revert to him from Isaac. Even though he'd given up his birthright and, and all that, I'm wondering if he thought, wow, if Jacob's dead, then it'll, I'll still get it all. And then Jacob returns. And I'm wondering if bitterness just became too much. Don't know. It's just me thinking with my mouth open because that's kind of what I do here. But sometimes some relationships are just irretrievable. Uh, I had a friend years ago and we had a conflict. I, I truly believe he was in the wrong and he believed I was in the wrong. Neither of us budged. And
And to this day, now we, we've shaken hands since then, and uh, but we're not friends anymore. And that hurts. So sometimes, but sometimes some relationships are just irretrievable. Um, I have friends of mine that we would be friends if were it not for what I believed about my Christianity and my faith and the morality that that involves. And they can't get past that, and I'm not going to compromise that. So though we might have been friends once, we can't be friends anymore. It hurts. It's sad. But sometimes relationships are just irretrievable. And apparently that's what's happening here between the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. That grudge is so deep that 400 and some odd years later, Esau's descendants are still angry and they attacked Israel. They knew who they were and they attacked them. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Wow. You want the definition of a couple friends? There you are. Their job was to support Moses, to hold up his arms, so that ultimately the battle would be won by Joshua. And I, I guarantee you, any glory that came from this would have attached itself to Joshua as the leader of the army that defeated the Amalekites, and Moses, being Moses, the leader of Israel. I'd be willing to bet that Aaron and her, aside from this remembrance of them in this in this narrative, I would be willing to bet that they didn't get much glory from this. But God knew. Moses knew. And I'm sure Joshua would find out. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. And make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. God is going to destroy these descendants of Esau. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. As he said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. The Amalekites started this. God is going to finish it. God is our warrior. He's the one that goes before us. He's the one that go, stands behind us. He's the one that surrounds us with this favor like a shield. And God will fight our battles. He fought Israel's battle against Pharaoh. He defeated the Pharaoh without Israel having to lift a finger. In this battle, Israel lifted a few fingers, swords. But God won the battle for them. As long as Moses held his hands up, the battle went well. And they eventually won through the power of the Lord and through the direction of the Lord. Sometimes God will fight our battles for us and we don't have to lift a finger. My dad used to tell me that your reputa a man's reputation should be such that when somebody lies about him, people automatically know it's a lie. Your reputation defends you. Your integrity defends you. But there's sometimes all the integrity in the world can't keep you from the necessity of what, like they used to say growing up, sometimes you got to throw hands. Sometimes you got to get in the struggle. You have to fight. And... Sometimes God calls you into battle. Sometimes God calls you to stay on the side and let him do the battle. Can't tell you the difference between uh, how do you know which is which. 
But God gave Moses very specific instructions here and gave Joshua very explicit instructions here. And I don't know what other lessons to derive from that, except that sometimes God fights for you. Other times, you have to go and swing in. I've tried to live my life such that my reputation is my greatest defense. I don't think I've been totally successful with that because I'm human. But I don't know many people who could bring anything against me because I've tried so hard to be honest and to walk with integrity. I get that from the Bible, from what I read about God and his and his nature. I got a lot of that from my dad. That's the way my dad was. My dad believed a man's word was everything. If you broke your word to my dad, you would have to work very hard to win his respect back. He believed your handshake and your word were the most important things. And he didn't care what color your skin was. We lived in a black neighborhood when I was growing up, when I was a young child. I played with black kids up through third grade before our family moved out of the neighborhood. We were the only white family for blocks around. We never had any problems with our neighbors, nor they with us. Because my dad's reputation was such that a man was a man was a man, no matter what he looked like. And if you treated him fairly, he would treat you fairly. So my dad's reputation was such that he never got in any kind of a conflict with another man. And I've tried to live my life that way. Sometimes God does your fighting for you. Sometimes, like I said before, sometimes you might have to throw hands yourself. Uh, God will make it clear which is which. Sometimes we're not called to defend ourselves. Sometimes we are. I will say that the sin of Esau apparently was still alive and well in his descendants, the Amalekites. And God is getting ready finally to deal with them. And he dealt them their first blow with Joshua. All right, well, that's about it for today. Um, I'm loving this journey through Exodus. Uh, this is the, you know, it's, I've read this stuff dozens of times in my lifetime. And again, it's like I'm reading it for the first time. I hope you have a fabulous day. God bless you. And I will see you a little bit further up the creek. Another thing my dad would say. <laughs> Bye-bye. You know, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. And come to think of it, my thoughts shouldn't be your thoughts either. You need to think for yourself. <laughs>